All right, so we live right now. What's up, everybody? Thanks for clicking this video. Thanks for tuning into my channel. My name's Simon Hill, Black American from Louisiana, coming to you live from Budapest, Hungary. It's about 1.30 a.m. where I'm at. Took a nice nap today. It was a holiday today, so I was chilling at the crib. Did a movie review with my wife for Cinema Crossroads, our podcast on Spotify, so go check that out. Also, new episodes of Backpack Bandits, my travel content coming out uh, on that channel, so go subscribe there. Also, today was a big day because I finished the E40 list. I finished writing and reviewing all 28 E40 albums and ranking episodes I did for them. The latest one I did is on Talib Kweli. Before that, it was Jodeci, then Twista, and then DJ Quick. So go check out those videos as well. And yeah, subscribe to this channel because there's always new content coming here and always something interesting happening. I, so, I appreciate everybody who watched the shorts that I posted of me and my wife acting in a uh, <laughs> commercial for a video game. I appreciate all the people that liked that, that laughed at it. You know, it was fun uh, recording it, acting in that. It, do you think your boy could be a thespian? <laughs> do you think I could be uh, a top grade actor? Y'all let me know. I, I think my acting skills weren't that bad. The, the hard part about acting is just remembering the lines. Other than that, it's just doing it. It's just like any other job, right? But uh, yeah, I got a comment this morning from my guy, Thomas Anderson, uh, who asked me if I was going to go live. And I was very uh, happy to see that comment. So yeah, I've been meaning to go live for the past few days. But like I said, I've been busy with so many other things, uh, working a lot, teaching English, writing, and uh, yeah, doing the movie reviews as well. So always busy, always got something happening. But I want to say thank you to everybody who does like these live streams. I love coming on live. I actually like going live the most. It's the most fun part of the social media platforms and activities that I do because I love chopping it up with the people. I love learning new things. I love reading these stories with the people. I love getting y'all feedback. I love spanking y'all that come into the comment section and start talking crazy to me. So I like doing all of that. So I just want to continue to try to do it. But it depends on the relationship I have with y'all. It depends on if you like it, if you comment, if you subscribe, if you send the hearts, if you send super chats. I don't beg for super chats. I don't ask for money, anything like that. But I just need that feedback from the people that gives me the encouragement to continue to do it. Because it's hard to continue to try to do something you love if people don't show you the love back. You get what I'm saying? And I really do think I provide a valuable service uh, by reading these stories and giving my take on them because I feel like the, the perspective I have is not represented by any other, anybody else on YouTube, anybody else on social media. Uh, I don't do content hating on Black people, hating Black women. This isn't red pill content. This isn't, you know, uh, calling out uh, certain Black people for how they act or anything like that. This is just for educational purposes, finding nuance in stories, learning from these stories, and uh, growing from these stories that we learn together from. So if I've ever said anything in the past that you found offensive, or if I've ever uh, contradicted anything that I just said that I believe my message is, I apologize, because what I'm really trying to do is uh, bring education, drop knowledge, drop gems, have fun with the people, laugh at these crazy stories, laugh at the white supremacists, uh, try to challenge the narratives that are in society that don't make any sense to me, and just keep it real and keep it trill, because this is Simon Hill, keeps it what? Keeps it trill. Anyway, so today I have a few stories lined up. I got about four stories I want to read, and I'm going to be on live maybe an hour, hour Hour and a half, and we're going to be talking about the Frank Afrique, <laughs> the Frank, the French speaking black world, because I feel like a lot of the stories I've been covering on my channel have been related to the English speaking black world uh, and that sort of stuff. But our, our experiences are wide, our experiences are varied, and I do believe it's important to talk about the stories of French speaking black people and what's happening in their life and stuff like that. And plus, we can learn about you know, our experiences, we can learn and grow from each other by talking about these stories. So I have a few interesting uh, topics I want to cover today, and I'm just going to jump into it. So a few days ago, I covered the elections that happened in Senegal. Basically, the Senegalese people uh, rioted against their president who was trying to stay in power for another you know, uh, another term unconstitutionally, the Senegalese people rioted and they ended up having an election and they voted in the youngest democratically elected black man on the African continent. Bravo, bravo. Beautiful to see democracy in play. Beautiful to see the voice of the people being heard and that sort of stuff. So I was glad to see that happen. So uh, we're going to jump into the story about how this happened. How did this young man 
who came out of nowhere, some people say, end up rising to the highest office in his land. So from village to prison to Africa's youngest elected president, how did Basiro Diome Faye, age 44, go from obscurity to a resounding win in Senegal's presidential election? At the family homestead, one relative explained, this family is not new to ruling. And for anybody who doesn't know, Senegal is a you know, multilingual African nation, but French is a primary language there because they were colonized by the French. So that's why it's included in this live stream. So let's get into it. Uh, th by the way, the brother's got two wives. Here are his two wives with him. And that, once again, the question is, who is the first lady? Are the girls bickering over who is the first lady? <laughs> she is like, I am the first lady. And she say, no, Beach, I am the first lady. <laughs> I got to know. But that's hard. That's hard. You ain't never seen nothing like that. Ain't none of the cool leaders got two wives. I, I bet all the cool leaders got concubines. All the cool leaders got to pay for it. My man pimping so strong, he got two of the baddest with him. Come on, man. Come on. Anyway, uh, the top opposition candidate, Basiru Diome Fay, uh, flanked by his two wives after voting in the presidential election in the West African nation of Senegal last Sunday in his hometown, uh, India Ganyo. Uh, he won resoundingly. Sorry if I'm butchering the names. I'm trying my best. This was written by Ruth McLean, published on March 28th, 2024. I believe I read some of Ruth's uh, other work in the previous live stream about this same topic, actually. Uh, continuing here. So the first election that Basiru Diome Faye ever won was the one that just made him the president-elect of Senegal. Before his victory in election last Sunday, 10 days after he was released from jail, Mr. Faye had only ever run for mayor of his home hometown India Ganyo, uh, a small settlement on a sandy track, crisscrossed by horse carts carrying women and their wares to the market. He lost that election in 2022 to the ruling party's candidate. I got to say this, by the way, we need to ban the box. If you don't know what ban the box is, it means... Um, you know, ban on the applications when you're applying for a job saying, have you ever had a criminal offense? Have you ever been in jail? Have you ever been arrested? And that sort of stuff. We need to ban that because if people can be in jail and then become president like Nelson Mandela, like uh, uh, Mr. Fay right here, uh, like Donald Trump might be, <laughs> he might be in jail and be the president if he wins the election, then I should be able to work at Taco Bell without having you to know that I got uh, arrested for marijuana possession or something like that. By the way, I'm not a smoker. I don't smoke weed. I've never been arrested for weed or anything like that. But yet and still, yet and still, people should be able to have jobs and have opportunities without their criminal past being brought up. Because what if it was constitutionally impossible for this young man who the people wanted to be elected uh, uh, could not run because, oh, he was a criminal, even if it was trumped up charges, right? People should be able to, you know, have jobs even if they have a past. That's my that's my two cents. I just want to put throw that out there. So few in Senegal know the remarkable remarkable journey of the 44-year-old tax inspector who wrote a wave of youth discontent to become, once inaugurated, Africa's youngest elected president. Provisional results officially released on Tuesday showed he won with 54% of the vote. But through interviews with family and friends in India Ganyo and the outlying village where he was raised, a picture emerged of a studious, loyal, curious, and sometimes stubborn man rooted in Senegalese traditions and his Islamic faith. With a deep understanding of the predicament facing his country's legion of frustrated youth. He didn't come from nowhere, Diome Fay, the uncle after uh, whom he is named, said in an interview at the President Alex's family home, a tidy, modest compound that hosted a huge impromptu party on Sunday night. He added, This family is not new to ruling. Now, I don't know where the uncle is going with this. I don't know if the uncle is going to start pulling out, like, you know, the family tree or the family photo album and say, See, see, my great, 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 great uncle was a prince. He was a king, nigga. <laughs> I don't know if that's where he's going with this, but that would be hilarious. But, you know, uh, great to see young people rise up and take control and, and lead their nations into the future. <clears throat> you know, there's an interesting uh, sci-fi short story. This The sci-fi short story that I was uh, listening to while I was in the gym one time, um, it's about this future where people cannot die. And the people live like 10,000 years in the future, but their culture is still the same. So they're still playing American football. They're still, you know, paying with uh, 
you know, $20 bills for something that costs $10 and stuff like that. Because in the future, there is no new culture because all the young people are not being born. It takes young people to continue to move culture, move society forward. We have to have new blood in society. And unfortunately, in a lot of these African nations, but in many countries around the world, the old people want to stay in charge and they don't want culture to move forward, which is stifling their nation, stifling growth. We don't like sometimes what the youth do, like wear skinny jeans or listen to, I don't know, Lil Uzi Vert. We hate their music. We hate their fashion. But it's important for human beings to, to allow the youth to have uh, power, to allow the youth to rise. This is why so many people in America are upset that, you know, this year we have a re-election between two guys in their 80s in their 80s. And the average age of an American is about my age, about 33, 34 years old, something like that, right? Our country is ran by old people. Our, our thinking will not move forward. Our, our culture will not move forward. Our society will not move forward unless the youth have a democratic voice, unless they are able to speak freely and, and have their elected representatives uh, speak for them and bring change. I just want to put that out there. Continuing here. So the local branch of the main opposition party, Pastef, in Mr. Faye's rural hometown, India Ganyo, two years ago, he ran for mayor there and lost. Okay. It's just like Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln lost every election except president. <laughs> All right. Mr. Fay's forefather, a hunter, was the founder of their village centuries ago. His grandfather was the village chief and one of the African soldiers conscripted by France to fight in World War I before he was badly wounded in battle. Returning home, his grandfather fought for the establishment of the first high school in Indiaganio, a struggle that was such a threat to colonial era administrators that it landed him in jail. Okay, he's got a family full of full of criminals. <laughs> you know how people say in my comment section, or they, they dis, uh, disrespect Black people by saying that we have a criminal culture, or we have a society of criminals, thugs, and gangsters, and stuff like that. Most of our most of our prisoners have been political prisoners. When we think about our history, right, most of the uh, Black people who were locked up in America, right, they have been people who were trying to buck the system and fight the system. Let's keep this absolutely real. During the Black Codes era, during Jim Crow era, they would lock up Black men for anything, for going to vote, for trying to get a job, for shopping in a, in a white-only supermarket and that sort of stuff. They need to really correct the history, and we need to set that straight for anybody who ever comes on this channel and says that that black people are natural thugs, criminals, and gangsters. Just look at the prisons, look at TV, look at hip hop and all this sort of stuff. Stop it. Stop it. Our people are just like Mr. Faye's great ancestors. They were fighting colonialism, fighting oppression, and ending up in jail for it. So Mr. Faye comes from a long lineage of people who have been doing the right thing, being on the right side of history. So salute to his grandfather. All right, continuing here. Basiru grew up in an environment where people fight for other people's rights. The elder Diome Faye said of his nephew. Beautiful, beautiful to see that. So this is Senegal right here. Senegal is this country in West Africa. It has the Gambia inside of it, which is a country, you know, mostly uh, based around the Gambian River. My wife and I did a live stream about British people going to the Gambia and sleeping with uh, uh, the locals there. <laughs> so go check that out in the live stream section on my channel. Uh, the largest city is Dakar, which I believe is also the capital. And the Senegalese people that I've spoken to have been very, very erudite. I don't know how to describe it. They're very, very cool people. I like the Senegalese people. I think a lot of them are also very tall. It's a very Muslim country, very respectable people. I like the Senegalese. They're cool. They're cool. I rock with them. All right. I'm going to uh, continue here. Uh, it was standing up uh, for his political ally that got Mr. Fay jailed. He was in prison last April over a Facebook post criticizing the government for its prosecution of Osman Sanko, Senegal's foremost opposition politician. Mr. Sanko was barred from running for president after he was convicted of defamation and of corrupting a minor. He had been accused of rape, but was acquitted on those charges. So Mr. Sanko named Mr. Fay his proxy. At the time, Mr. Fay was imprisoned in a tiny cell where he slept, ate, showered, and exercised with three other prisoners. He spent 10 months in that jail cell from which he started his bid for the presidency. That's hard. 
that's hard. You in jail doing push-ups and burpees with the other inmates, and you like, yeah, guys, I'm gonna run for president. Ten months later, you at the you at the <laughs> you at the inauguration ceremony with your two wives, standing tall, standing strong, standing black. That's gangster. That's gangster. That's hard. I like that. I like that. Anyway, continuing here. Uh, when Mr. Fay and Mr. Sanko were released two weeks ago, ten days before a presidential election that the incumbent Mackey Saul had tried and failed to cancel, almost everyone in the West African country knew Mr. Sanko's name. So I believe this is Mr. Fay right here. I believe Sanko is ineligible to run. And what I'm hearing from other YouTubers and also from the news is that Mr. Fay is actually not who the people want. They want they wanted Mr. Sanko, but Sanko is barred from running because I believe he does have that, you know, that rape charge hanging over his head. So the vote for Fay was like voting for Mr. Sanko. So, you know, they're buddies, they're allies, so they're part of the same political party. So it's like one and the same. It's like if you vote for Biden, but Biden dies and you get Kamala instead, you're like, that's okay because he's a part, she's a part of the party, she's a part of the movement, she's exactly like what we want and stuff like that. By the way, I'm not a Democrat for anybody who's going to come in here and say Simon Hill, the Democratic shill. No, I'm not. I am Simon Hill and I keep it trail and I call out everybody. Continuing here, Mr. Faye in white with Usman Sanko, uh, the preeminent uh, opposition Position, politician behind him campaigning in southern Senegal two days after they were released from jail. Uh, but few knew Mr. Faze, uh, but few knew Mr. Faze. Okay, I don't know why they wrote it like that. Or maybe they didn't know Mr. Faze's name. Okay, yeah, they didn't know Mr. Faze's name, but they knew Sanko's name. Continuing, the two men immediately hit the campaign trail together, trying to change that. The goal appeared to be to make their names synonymous, and it may have worked. On election day, many young people said they were voting for Sanko. Mr. Faye describes himself as someone who normally doesn't talk very much, but when he got out of jail and realized how much support he and Mr. Sanko had, he wanted to thank everyone personally. He said, when I saw the number of people coming out, I just wanted to give all of them a hug. He said in a long interview with Sene People, a local media outlet last week, and say sorry for all the trouble you had to face. In many, see, the, see, ain't that respectable? <laughs> the people were protesting. <laughs> The people were protesting for you to be able to run for president. And the Senegalese guy says, I'm so sorry for the trouble you had to face. That's respectable. <laughs> Talk about respectability politics. <laughs> people say, I'm too nice. That's too nice. That's too nice. I would have been on the crowd like, y'all the realists. Y'all the trillists. Yeah, your boy in office now. Gang, gang. We running the country. The inmates running the, the, inmates running the prison. <laughs> but instead, he, get, he grabs the mic and says, I'm so sorry for the trouble you had to face. That's, that's hilarious. Hilarious. That's hilarious. I'm continuing here. Uh, in many ways, Mr. Fay comes across as a typical young Senegalese man, passionate on Facebook, often seen wearing wireless earbuds and seeming more comfortable in a traditional kaftan than in the tailored Western style suit favored by his predecessor, Mr. Saul. Is Facebook still really big? I have not been on Facebook in years. And I feel like the only time I hear about Facebook is when, like, you know, my dad is posting like wild you know, outrageous political thoughts on Facebook or like, you know, I go to the third world and like people in the Philippines use Facebook to like vote or like, you know, renew their driver's license. Is Facebook still really a thing? Is anybody using Facebook? Fairly, really, let me know. I mean, if you're using Instagram, you're using Facebook, right? Because all these media companies are incestuously tied together. But continuing here, uh, a campaign poster in the courtyard of Mr. Faye's family home. Growing up, he shared a home with more than 10 adults and a group of ch children he ran with, his uncle said. All right, uh, uh, continuing here. Until his time was swallowed up by politics, he was a keen soccer player, according to his childhood friend, Moore Sar. He played most recently on a team of tax inspectors in the capital, Dakar. Like many young people in Soccer Mad Senegal, Mr. Fay is a fan of the Spanish team, Real Madrid, Mr. Starr said. Basiru Diome Fay, pronounced Basiru Jimi Fay, Jimi Fay, oh, Jumi, Jumi Fay. I'm going to say it my way. I don't, I'm not going to let a white woman tell me how to say an African name. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Fay grew up in a house occupied by more than 10 adults and a gaggle of children he ran around with, according to his uncle. But he could often be found reading. A favorite, according to Mr. Sar, was Dal Carnegie, Dale Carnegie, pardon, the American author of How to Win Friends and Influence People. I read that book. 
uh, when I was very young, I thought it was uh, okay. Some things I still, you know, remember like people like hearing uh, their own name. So if you talk to somebody for the first time, try to say their name as much as possible because that's the sweetest sound they'll hear. Uh, so yeah, continuing here. Uh, he's young in years, but not in his intelligence and behavior, said Mr. Faye's father, Samba Indigane Faye, 92, also a former village chief, sitting in the cool of his curtain living room with some of the village elders. Both he and his father went into politics both of them in the ruling party. 92 years old. 92 years old. Here's the guy's father. Still look young. He still look healthy. That's that, you know, that's that, uh, uh, how can I say that's that Sahelian air. When you breathe in that clean Sahelian air with a few bits of, you know, micro dust uh, in, <laughs> into the lungs, it probably keeps you looking young, happy, and healthy. Plus having strong Iman. This man looks like he does a lot more than anybody on the planet. Seriously. Well, let me check that man's forehead. See if he got that dot. Maybe it's under the kufi. Continuing here. Uh, Samba Indigane Faye, the president-elect's father, said he told his son to always be honest, humble, and not driven by money. That was in him, but I encouraged it, he said. Samba Indigane Faye was often away from home because of his political activities, an absence that deeply affected the newly elected president. He hated politics, Mr. Sar, who said he he grew up with Mr. Faye, shared a room with him at the university in Dakar and introduced him to his first wife. First wife. Did he introduce him to the second wife too? Or did the first wife introduce him to the second wife? <laughs> How did that work? Uh, that, that, that story needs to be told. That's the greatest story ever told. <laughs> I'm continuing. Uh, rumors that Mr. Fay is in Ibadu, a local parlance for a fundamentalist Muslim, are false and politically motivated, Mr. Fay's family and friends said. He's religious, yes, but less religious than me, Mr. Sar said laughing. I don't dance, he dances. I don't listen to music, he does. Very interesting. You know, I can't wait to visit Senegal one day and see how the dean is out there. <coughs> you know, one of the most interesting things for me when I travel, is going to different Muslim countries or countries where there is uh, a sizable Muslim population and seeing how they pray there, seeing what the mosque looks like, and, and talking to the people and figuring out, you know, how do they view Islam? That's one of the most enlightening things for me. That's why I always have on my channel when I travel somewhere, what's it like to pray in Turkey? What's it like to pray in Albania? What's it like to pray, you know, in Serbia or something like that? I didn't do the pray in Serbia video. I know I should have, but uh, yeah. Anyway, continuing here. <coughs> Basiru Diome Faye, second from right, with his childhood friend, Mr. Sar, to his right, in a photograph from 1997. My man was styling in the Adidas. Continuing here. Mr. Faye has two wives. Polygamy is common in Senegal, including among his ethnic group, the Serer. Being married to two wives is a sign of responsibility, said his elder brother, Ibrahima Faye. He's very proud of being polygamous, and he doesn't hide it. He has four children with his first wife, one of whom is named Usman after Mr. Sanko. He married his second wife, who lives and works in France early last year. The couple saw each other uh, only once between their wedding and Mr. Faye's arrest. The next time they were together, it was on the campaign trail, Mr. Sar said. Mr. Faye and Mr. Sanko have emphasized Senegal's sovereignty, sovereignty from France, its former colonial ruler, and the need to replace the France-backed currency. The uncle com compared his nephew's political agenda to the American Federalist leaders' quest for independence from Britain. The battles that they were fighting, uh, the battles that they're fighting right now are the battles that Madison, John Jay, and Hamilton fought. I don't know if you want to bring in American founding fathers here because they wouldn't look at any of the Senegalese people as people. I mean, these were racist, slave-owning, uh, sexist, you know, white supremacists. Uh, you know, we can admire the founding fathers for their ideals, <laughs> but uh, we have to keep it real that the founding fathers were a bunch of bourgeoisie, you know, very rich, wealthy guys who were just fighting for their right to rule the land rather than have to pay the king tithes. Just continuing from here. Uh, before the election, Mr. Fay declared his assets an unusual move for a politician in West Africa. The list included a house in Dakar built on land that was given to him by the government as part of a program allocating land to civil servants. It also included a field a few miles from India Ganyo, where he where the president-elect grows fruits and vegetables to sell. On Tuesday afternoon, Mr. Sar kicked at the cracked earth surrounding Mr. Fay's orchard of papaya trees, which have suffered since he went to jail. 
not enough water, he said. All right, this is the land here that he was given. So yeah, growing some papaya trees. I've never seen a papaya tree. I didn't know they looked like that. Very cool. I like papaya. Papaya smoothies, excellent. Jump into the comments right here. Uh, Rodman said, Faye, uh, Faye made a hell of an inauguration speech. I didn't get to see the inauguration speech. Summarize it for us, Rodman. But shout out to Rodman for jumping into the chat. Papaya trees growing on a plant of farmland acquired by Mr. Faye in 2022 in San Diara near India. Ganio. Mr. Fay had been planning on leaving his job as a tax inspector to focus on politics and agriculture, Mr. Sar said. But that was back when hardly anyone knew who he was. The Senegalese are learning who Mr. Fay is fast. 19-year-old Bay Lay India uh, stood taking selfies in the Fay compound on Tuesday morning. Mr. NDA, uh, who travels the country hawking mobile phones, had asked for directions to the house just to see where his new president came from. Last year, Mr. NDA was one of around 1,000 people jailed in connection with protests that followed Mr. Sanko's arrest. He said he had been walking down the street wearing a plastic bracelet with the word PASTEF on it, the name of the opposition party founded by Mr. Sanko. That was enough to get him locked up for three months. This repression that's happening in Africa that unfortunately a lot of Black people seem to like, you guys like it when coup leaders come, when the guys with AK-47s run into the building and say, we are freeing Africa from France. We're freeing Africa from the British people, uh, from neocolonialism. Meanwhile, they allow the Russians to come in. And meanwhile, they don't allow political dissent. Meanwhile, they don't allow freedom of expression. You niggas love to see that. You niggas love to see that. How would you like to live under that system? This is a shame. This is an embarrassment that this can happen in Africa, bro, amongst black people. We should be able to have countries where freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of life, freedom to love who you want to love, freedom to be where you want to be, freedom to think how you want to think, to be religious or non-religious, whatever. That needs to exist for black people. But if you don't want that for black people, just say that you're a fascist. Just say that you're a black Nazi. Just say that you want to suck the dick of all those black cool leaders who who tore apart these countries, who, who threw democratically elected presidents in jail. I hope that nothing bad happens to Mr. Fay, and I hope the Senegalese people finally see some change for their country. I hope they do get rid of the CFA Frank. I hope they do have more sovereignty for Senegal and the other Frank Afrique countries. But yet and still, we cannot be supporting fascist coup leaders. We can't just salute the guys with the Toyota pickup trucks who run in there with AK-47s. And we cannot arrest people just for supporting a political party that's the opposition from the ones in power. Let's keep that absolutely real. I hope that makes sense to y'all because I'm tired of seeing that in my news feed. And nobody else is saying this on YouTube, but y'all going to be quiet about that, huh? Y'all ain't got nothing to say about that. Continuing here. Uh, so he was delighted to find that Mr. Faye's roots were humble, not so different from his own. Senegal needs presidents who have this kind of background, he said. Looking around at the peeling paint and the cracked tiles, Diome knows the suffering people are facing. So this is the guy right here, the taxi driver who got arrested, thrown in jail. Uh, not a taxi driver, mobile phone salesman. He's taking a selfie at the guy's house. A bit stalkerish, but hey, I get the sentiment. All right. Bay Lay Indiana is supported taking selfies in Mr. Faye's family house on Tuesday. Mr. Indiana uh, said he was jailed with little food or water for wearing a bracelet with the name of Mr. Fay's party. So that's the end of the article right here. Shout out to Ruth McLean once again for writing all of these great articles about Africa. Uh, once again, I hope Mr. Fay is successful. I hope he doesn't try become a corrupt African leader. He should be able to respect Senegal's democracy, which so far has not had any coups which has not had, you know, presidents being assassinated and that sort of stuff. I hope he is able to do his term and then leave because what shows a great leader is when they're able to walk away from power. This is probably one of the only good things about American democracy is that our presidents generally walk away until Trump's fat ass got up in there. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Now going to Aya Nakamura. So y'all might know that song she did. Ooh, ja, ja. Something, something, ja, ja. I don't know that song. I don't speak French. I went to France. I've never seen more rich niggas in my life than when I went to Paris. I swear to God. Going to Paris, to me, was actually one of the best things I've ever done in my life. I was only there for about three days. I've never seen that many rich black people walking around. 
I've I've never been to Atlanta, so maybe I'm missing something in my ideas about what rich black folks look like. But I've never seen as many rich niggas as when I went to Paris. Facts. Uh, going to uh, the comments right here, Rodman says, hopefully Fade takes the offer to join the AES and shows the world the beginning of real African power. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope so. But I'm not familiar with the AES. I've heard of ECOWAS. Because in Senegal is an ECOWAS, but what is the AES? I, uh, African something society? I'm not sure. Break it down for me. I'm not that well read, guys. <laughs> I'm not that smart. I'm not that smart. You got to break it down for me. Anyway, we're going to jump to Aya Nakamura, who's killing it with the white nails. Ooh, girl. Okay. Uh, so Aya Nakamura is France's most popular singer at home and abroad with 25 top 10 singles in France and over 20 million followers on social media. A French Malayan uh, singer is caught in an Olympic storm. Aya Nakamura's music is one of France's top cultural exports, but reports that she might perform at the Paris Games have prompted fierce debates over identity and language. Now, first and foremost, it's a shame that in France, you know, this very popular singer who I would compare, maybe she's like the Beyonce of France, right? People would get upset about this black woman representing France uh, at the Olympics, right? And we know who these people are. These are white supremacists. These are nationalists. These are xenophobes. Uh, you know, why are, why are people so, why, are, why do people have such little dick energy? Why do people get so upset about this sort of stuff. I want to read more into the article, and I will be reacting to this article because I didn't read it beforehand, but I want to uh, jump into it. So this was written by Roger Cohen and Aurelien Breeden, published on March 26, 2024. In four months, France will host the Paris Olympics, but which France will show up? Torn between tradition and modernity, the country is in the midst of an identity crisis. The possible choice for the opening ceremony of Aya Nakamura, a superstar French Malian singer who slang spice lyrics stand at some distance from academic French has ignited a furor tinged with issues of race and linguistic propriety and the politics of immigration. Right-wing critics say Miss Nakamura's music does not represent France and the prospect of her performing has led to a barrage of racist insults online against her. The Paris prosecutor's office has opened an investigation. Now, I might say this. Some people might say we want to show, you know, the artistic side of France, the uh, sophisticated side of France. And maybe Aya Nakamura's music is more like, you know, poppy. You know, it's more twerking music. It's more, you know, booty shaking music. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the music or the musical climate in France. But, you know, in any musical genre or in any society, right, we have music that we consider high art and then we have low art, right? There's, uh, like I said, Lil Uzi Vert and then there's Tupac. Then there's Jay-Z and that sort of stuff. My frame of reference is hip hop, so I'm bringing it like that. And I'm not saying that Lil Uzi Vert doesn't have great songs, but when we think about lyrical capability, when we think about, you know, storytelling, um, you know, linguistic use of, of different vocabulary words, right? There's low-end rappers, Lil Baby, and then there's high-end rappers like Nas or Jay-Z, right? So maybe Aya Nakamura's music to some people is considered like the trashiest of trash. You get what I'm saying? Maybe that's where some people might be coming from, or other people just might be flat-out racist, who says this Black woman is speaking in broken pigeon French or something like that, and we don't want that representing our country. But newsflash, newsflash, French people take their language too seriously. Outside of France, nobody cares about your language. Nobody. I want to keep this absolutely clear. I want to keep this absolutely clear. Just like how if you don't speak English, you don't know the difference between a Southern accent or a New England accent, or you don't know the difference between a person from, you know, uh, Manchester or a person from, you know, Mansfield, California. You can't tell the difference if you don't speak the language. So I am not going to be listening to Aya Nakamura singing and saying, she said, Jou instead of vu. Nobody's thinking that. Nobody cares. So if the French people are getting all hot and bothered about this, please relax. Your language is not that serious. Continuing here. Uh, yeah, the outcry has compounded a fight over an official poster unveiled this month, a pastel rendering the city's landmarks, uh, thronging with people in a busy style reminiscent of the Where's Waldo children's books. Right-wing critics have attacked the image as a deliberate di dilution of the French nation and its history in a sea of sugary, irreproachable blandness, most evident in the removal of the cross atop the golden dome of the Invalides, the former military hospital where Napoleon is buried. 
An opinion essay in the right wing Journal du Dimanche said the malaise of a nation in the throes of deconstruction was in full view. I got to keep this absolutely real. None of that made sense to me. That was the most French thing I've ever read. That was more French than reading like the <laughs> instruction manual on how to make the perfect croissant. I don't understand any of that. I know I did this live stream to talk about like French black people and black people in the francophone world and that sort of stuff. But some of this is not making sense to me. <laughs> the French are very protective of their culture, their culture, right? Uh, and um, I don't mean to put culture in air quotes as if it's diminutive to say that French don't have a culture. Of course they have a culture. And of course their culture should be celebrated. But their culture is also multiracial. It's multi-ethnic. It's multifaceted. And it's not because people have invaded France. It's because France invaded the world and forced people to speak their language. France, literally, their guy Napoleon, literally tried to invade every country in Europe and spread their culture. Then years later, they run out into the rest of the world and try to spread their culture, which is why half of Africa speaks French now. This is why, you know, half of Africa is a good portion of them are uh, Catholics and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, uh, the French have brought this upon themselves. They just need to accept their multi-ethnic, multi-racial uh, society now that they created on their own willing. If your country does not want to be multi-racial or multi-ethnic, then maybe you should not have invaded, raped, and pillaged the rest of the planet. Continuing here, uh, the rapid immersion of the Olympics in France's culture wars has its roots in a meeting on February 19th at the Elysee Palace between President Emmanuel Macron and Miss Nakamura, 28. Mr. Macron, doubling as the artistic director of the Olympics, asked if she would perform. By the way, it's, it's such a shame when I see somebody so much younger than me that succeeded so much more in life. Aya Nakamura is 28, and I'm 33 years old on live stream with four people. What does that say? <laughs> what does that say? What does that say? Jesus Christ, I need to get my shit together. All right, seriously. Uh, so the official poster of the Olympic Games in Paris has been attacked by right-wing critics as a deliberate dilution of the French nation and its history. Okay, so this is the Where's Waldo poster that they're talking about. I think this is actually cool. This makes Paris not look stinky. It makes it not look smelly. It makes it actually not look, you know, staid and boring. This makes Paris look actually pretty live. I like that. That's hard. But see, the French won't like it because no, no, no. The, they forgot that the Elysee is on the left side of Champs-Élysées or some shit like that. I don't get it, man. Y'all got to stop being so... Ugh, about your culture. It's very gross. Continuing here. Miss Nakamura is by some distance uh, France's most popular singer at home and abroad with 25 top 10 singles in France and over 20 million followers on social media. Born Aya Danilko in Bamako, Mali, she took her stage name from a character in Heroes, a science fiction series on NBC. Raised in a suburb of Paris, she mixes French lyrics with Arabic, English, and West African language languages like Bambara, the Malian language of her parents, and songs that interweave R&B, Zouk, and the rhythms of Afropop. See, this is, uh, this is you know, this is Gen Z, you know, mixed up playlist, you know, uh, Spotify on shuffle. You know, this is what I was talking about with the Senegal piece. We have to let the next generation grow and do it. She was born in Mali, moved to France, influenced by, you know, all the things that Western society brings, like multiculturalism. So she's going to be singing in Arabic, English, some Bambara, you know, of course, French too. You know, she's going to be like styling like an African-American, but putting that French swag on it. Because let's keep it real, like Aya Nakamura's swag is very African-American, like the rest of the world. The rest of the world's swag does come from us. But like I'm saying, like the, the next generation, Gen Z or Gen Y or whatever, you know, horrible generation will come after the greatest generation, millennials because I'm always pop my collar for anybody born in 1990 to 95, you feel me? But let's keep it real. The next generation got their own swag and what they want to bring to the table. So we got to support them. Going to jump to the comments right here. Thomas Anderson says, transatlantic slave trade was biggest immigration event uh, in history, 12 million people. Some people say even more than 12 million people. They just think 12 million is a conservative number. Rodman says Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso formed an alliance and called it the AES and kicked the French out. Okay, so Rodman, I want to ask you sincerely, do you think it's okay for a bunch of young men and Toyota pickup trucks to run up in the Capitol, kidnap the president, and throw them in jail? Do you think that's a good thing? Do you think that's a good thing? Because that's what the AES is. Do you think it's a good thing for Black people to say that we don't want colonialism or neo-colonialism in Africa? Meanwhile, they sell all their gold to the Russians. 
Meanwhile, they allow Russian mercenaries to come into the remote parts of their country and exterminate black people. Because that's what Niger, Mali, and Guinea, and all those coup leaders are doing in their countries. Seriously. Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, these are fascist places. These are the worst examples of the type of societies that we want for black people. But Rodman, I'm an, I'm an, you know, I'm an even heal, I'm an even killed man. If you have more information that tells me that these places are great for black folks, that they are advancing black life just because they kicked out the French, tell me more. Tell me more, Rodman. Tell me why we should be supporting coup leaders, fascists, despots in black Africa. Tell me, Rodman, why that's a good thing. Why that's a good thing. Anyway, continuing here. Thomas Anderson, large populations of Europeans illegally immigrated in numbers never seen to the American continents and other places. Facts, facts. You know, what's funny, somebody in my comment section said, uh, you know, immigrants, migrants like you, Simon, a racist white person said this in my comments, migrants like you are ruining Europe, just like how migrants ruined America. And I wanted to clap back at him so bad because he was obviously talking about, you know, the migrants from Venezuela, Colombia, or black people now, or Chinese people coming to America. But the original migrants that ruined America were the Welsh, were the French, were the Germans, were the uh, Norwegians, were the Danish, were the Hungarians, were the Italians. These were the original people, because what did they do? They literally brought death, disease, destruction. Anything the white supremacists say about us is literally a projection, because their own grandfathers literally showed up into a land, coughed on the people, People, gave them smallpox, and then raped their children. Are we really going to talk about migrants here? Anyway, continuing here uh, with Aya Nakamura's story. Uh, yeah, continuing. So this isn't a beautiful symbol. It's a new provocation by Emmanuel Macron, who must wake up every morning wondering how he can humiliate the French people. Marine Le Pen, a leader of the far-right National Rally Party, told France Interradio, alluding to the possible choice of Miss Nakamura. She insisted that Miss Nakamura sang who knows what language, certainly not French, and was unfit to represent the country. Okay, so this woman here needs to be... Uh, checked in the head. She really needs to be checked in the head. Seriously, Marine Le Pen, if she becomes the president of France, it's over. It's over. It's done. Like Marine Le Pen is a far-right nationalist, uh, pseudo-Nazi, uh, who's, you know, who's been campaigning for the top job in France for a while now. And hopefully she doesn't get it. But seriously, language has changed. This is the thing about policing language. It needs to stop. You know, as an English teacher, I literally talk to people about English all the time. And people say, oh, that word is in English, patio, uh, you know, uh, and stuff like that. Like I teach a lot of uh, of Latin Americans, so Spanish often comes up. And yeah, in English, we have a lot of Spanish words or words with Spanish origin. And if not, they're directly Spanish words. We have a lot of cognates and stuff like that. Language has changed because of cultural interaction, because of meetings between different people, because we need lingua francas and mutual understanding, right? This is a normal occurrence of human life. English in and of itself is an agglomeration and conglomeration of many different languages over many different centuries. So French was will change. You cannot keep a language in a box. Languages always grow and develop, right? It's, it's, it's ridiculous that some countries, right, instead of saying Instagram, they create a whole new specific word for what an Instagram is or what the internet is because they don't want to have English influence in a language, which I can understand it from an academic point of view because you want to understand how, you know, the roots of your language can be preserved. But when we're talking about society, music, culture, art, how people interact in the streets. You cannot police a language. A language will always change. Language is the most elastic and evolving thing about human life. All right, continuing here. Uh, Miss Nakamura, who declined a request for an interview, has not publicly addressed the Fuhrer beyond a few social media posts. On X, she responded to attacks by saying, you can be racist, but not deaf. Naturalized in 2021, the singer has dual French and Mal Malian citizenship. But in a country often ill at ease with this changing population, more diverse, less white, more questioning of the French model of identity, of facing assimilation, and supposedly undifferentiated citizenship, she stands on a fault line. Yeah, it's isn't that the thing, too? Aren't the French supposed to be all about liberté, égalité, fraternité? I didn't know it was about bloodlines, too, right? The French, you know, have a unique history in that they are or they were a nation that had monarchies and they were ethno-nationalist states like most countries in the world. But then they had their revolution and they sort of got rid of 
all of that. I'm simplifying French history here from how I understand it. But I understand the French have an understanding of citizenship just like how Americans have it. In a lot of other countries, you cannot truly be a citizen of X country unless you look a certain way, have a certain religion, have a certain race or something like that. But for America, we have Black, we have Americans that look like me. We have Americans that look like Brad Pitt. We have Americans that look like, you know, Bruce Lee, right? Uh, so we have all sorts of different types of people. And the French have sort of the same thing, too, or at least the same understanding of citizenship. So I don't understand why people would be attacking Aya Nakamura and saying that she's polluting French society or polluting French language when she is equally as French as anybody else, even if she was naturalized, right? So Avery Adams says, shout out to Simon and the chat. Shout out to Avery. That's the big dog on this channel. Would love to hear what Avery thinks of Aya Nakamura's music or anything related to these topics. Shout out to Avery. Everybody give a salute to him. So um, continuing here, there is an identity panic, said Rakhaya Diallo, a French author, filmmaker, and activist. I think France does not want to see itself the way it really is. Citing the soccer star Kylian Mbappe and Miss Nakamura, Miss Diallo uh, suggested that a white French France feels threatened in a way it did not 30 years ago. Miss Nakamura is held to an unfair standard because of her background, Miss Diallo added. Her linguistic creativity is going to be seen as incompetence instead of artistic talent, she said, because focusing solely on the artist's lyrics ignored the inventive musicality of her songs. The eldest of five siblings, Miss Nakamura, who is a single mother of two children, was born into a family of griots. Uh, traditional West African musicians and storytellers. Everyone sings in my family, she told Le Monde in 2017, but I'm the only one who dared to sing for real. Uh, her music has little overt political messaging. She told the New York Times in 2019, I'm happy if my songs speak for themselves, but she has also said she recognizes her place as a feminist role model. Her lyrics are often an ode to emancipated women who are firmly in control of their lives and unabashed about their sexuality. So Thomas Anderson said, change is coming at an unprecedented rate. The people are feeling that and they're scared. Uh, Nakamura, isn't she black? Yeah, I am Nakamura's black. Thomas Anderson, you didn't hear that song? Oh, Jaja, uh, something, something, Jaja. I don't know what Jaja is. Is Jaja is Jaja Coochie? I don't know. <laughs> you never heard of Aya Nakamura? She's hard. She's hard. Uh, but yeah, change is coming, and so yeah, the the dominant society does feel threatened by that. Uh, continuing here. At the start of my career, I was rather skeptical of this idea of a model. Uh, Miss Nakamura told CBS News. Uh, Oh, sorry. She told CB News, a marketing and pu uh, public relations trade publication in December, but it's a reality. I have influence. If through my work and my undertakings, I enable certain women to assert themselves, then that's something to be proud of. So here's Aya Nakamura right here. It looks like she's performing in Neon, Switzerland in July. She mixes French lyrics with Arabic, English, and West African dialects. I could understand, you know, to some degree why the French people might you know, might not like that she would represent the country because like I said before, maybe her music is seen as pop trash music, right? Like the same way we look at, I don't know, a lot of like Britney Spears songs or Miley Cyrus songs, like it's mindless pop music to some degree because you don't get 20 million followers being dead prez. <laughs> you don't get 20 million followers on Instagram being Talib Kweli, right? You get 20 million followers on Instagram by showing a lot of skin and making songs with very repetitive hooks. That's just a fact. So maybe the French don't like that. But I got to say this, most people, let's keep it absolutely real. In the English world, we think most people that speak French are actually smarter than us. Let's keep that absolutely a buck. Let's keep it real. So the rest of the world does look at France as like this somewhat sophisticated place, highly erudite, you know, place and stuff like that. So the French need to stop taking themselves so seriously about their language, culture, and all that sort of stuff. I just have to repeat that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Avery said facts, LOL. Yeah, exactly. If you met a black person that spoke French, you would be like, this nigga's a genius. <laughs> they don't really know. Uh, like, for real. Like, anyway, continuing here. The Fuhrer over his, uh, the Fuhrer over her possible performance reflects a fractured France. Some see a reactionary nation intent on ignoring how large scale immigration, particularly from North Africa, has enriched the country, hosting the 33rd Summer Olympics of modern times. Celebrities, left wing politicians, and government officials support 
the idea of Miss Nakamura taking a prominent role in the ceremony. Others, especially on the right, see a multicultural France intent on concealing its Christian roots, even the nation itself, especially with the erasure of the cross from the Invalid's Dome and the absence of a single French flag in the official poster. Mild pink, purple, and green are favored over the bold blue, white, and red of France. All right. Uh, every time the world is watching us, we give the impression we don't embrace who we are. Marianne Marechal, Miss Le Pen's niece and a leader of the extreme right Reconquête party, told French television last week. Then there is the question of language in this land of the Académie Française, uh, which was founded in 1634 to promote and protect the French language. It takes upon itself the task of shielding the country from brainless globish. Globish. I don't know what that is. Do they mean like globalism? Okay, I don't know. As one of the 40 members once put it, and it does so with ardor, uh, if with diminishing success, as France succumbs to a world of less les startupers, les startupers. Uh, okay, the French are annoying. They are so annoying about their language. In the English world, we don't have uh, an academy that polices the English language. You have dictionary makers, you have Oxford, you have that sort of stuff, but nobody says this is the official language of English, and this is the academy that describes what is English and not. English is very fluid. It's a language that doesn't have a lot of those barriers, and you know, every, I just wish that the French would chill about it. Like the, the French act like the French language is as important as it was in 1898. Like, it's really not that serious. They really need to chill about it. It's very annoying. And I know that French and English have like this competition and rivalry, but it's one-sided because the French, all they do is think about English and we don't even think about them at all. Let's keep it absolutely real. As an English speaker, we don't be thinking about the French. We think, okay, the French, baguettes, uh, accordions, uh, funny language, uh, touchy-feely guys, that's it. That's it. But they take their language so seriously, and they need to chill. They really need to chill. Going to jump into the comments right here. Uh, so uh, Thomas Anderson said, scared racists are saying that Paris was lost without any bullets uh, shot. Exactly. Exactly. Like, nobody is invading Paris. Nobody is trying to take over Paris or anything like that. These people are just, uh, you know, they're obsessed. But when you're at the top, you're obsessed about people knocking you off the top. So that's where I think a lot of this comes from. Continuing here, there is a sort of religion of language in France, said Julian Barrett, a linguist and writer who has written an online glossary of the language prevalent in the Balenou, where Miss Nakamura grew up. The Balenou, by the way, is like the suburbs because in, in France, from what I understand, it's the opposite of how it is in America. Like in America, the poor people live in the inner city. And rich people live in the suburbs. But in France, it's different. Poor people live in the suburbs outside the city, and all the rich people live in the interior. Continuing here. Uh, French identity is conflated with the French language, he added, in what amounts to a cult of purity. Uh, that so-called purity has long since ceased to exist. France's former African colonies increasingly infused the language with their own expressions. Singers and rappers, often raised in immigrant families, have coined new terms. You can't write a song like you write a school assignment, Mr. Barrett. Eclectic mix of French argot, like Verlan, which reverses the order of syllables. West African dialect, like New in the Ivorian, Ivory Coast, and innovative turns of phrases that are sometimes nonsensical but quickly catch on. In Jaja, her breakout song from 2018 that had become an anthem of female empowerment, she calls out a man who lies about sleeping with her by singing, I'm not your Katine, using a French using a centuries-old French term for a prostitute. It has been streamed about one billion times. <laughs> I'm not your Katine. <laughs> See, this is the thing. I don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, I don't get it, man. They take their language too seriously. But, you know, one of the funniest things about language is that there are obscure words that have very funny meanings. You know, when I just mentioned at the beginning of this live stream, I wrote about E-40. And E-40 did an interview with Talib Kweli. And um, while I was researching, I found out that E-40 found this very obscure word called Kalipjian. Calypgian. I'm going to write it in the chat so y'all can see it. Calypgian. I hope I spelled it right. Uh, I'm writing from uh, memory. Calypgian. I think it's like this. And Calypgian is a real English word that means a person with a nice butt or a beautiful ass and stuff like that, right? So it's very funny to find very obscure words in English or in any language, right? And it's crazy to see that she took this old 
you know, French word meaning prostitute and put it in a hit song. I didn't even, I don't even know what Jaja is saying, but I think it's it's great to that she brought that out, right? And so the French aristocrats or academics need to stop hating on her. Obviously, she knows the French language. She speaks it. She lives it. I don't think Aya Nakamura even speaks English, right? Like a lot of the world, like they just take English words that they hear that sound fly and mix it into their language and say it wrong, right? But that's the beauty of language. Language should change. Uh, continuing here. Another widely popular song is Puki, a diminutive for Pukov, slang that originates from Romani for a traitor or a rat. Uh, during the meeting with Mr. Macron, Ms., uh, uh, first revealed by the magazine Le Express, the president asked Miss Nakamura which French singer she liked. Her response was Edith Piaf, uh, the legendary artist who died in 1963 and famously regretted nothing. So Mr. Macron suggested to Miss Nakamura in an account that the presidency has not disputed, why not sing Piaf to open the Olympics? The idea is still under review. For some, Miss Nakamura channeling Piaf might be the perfect tribute to La Vie en Rose, Piaf's immortal anthem of Parisian romantic love. Bruno Le Maire, the economy minister and occasional author of erotic novels, said it would show panache and audacity. Supporters have noted that the two singers grew up in poverty and came from immigrant backgrounds. But a recent poll found that 63% of French people did not approve of Mr. Macron's idea, even though about half of the respondents said they knew of Ms. Nakamura only by name. Ms. Nakamura has encountered criticism of her music before in France, where expectations of assimilation are high. Some on the right complain she has become French, but shown more interest in her African roots or her American role models. She responded to her critics on French television in 2019, saying of her music, in the end, it speaks to everyone. I got to say this right here. I got to say this. If white people or the dominant society does not want black people to embrace Africanness. If y'all don't want us to be pro-black radicals, if y'all don't want us to, you know, uh, you know, always fight against white supremacy, how about your culture, your society, and the anti-black racism and discrimination that exists in these nations? Every black person in France wants to be as French as possible. They want to assimilate as much as possible. They want to be feel, they want to feel like they're a part of that society and treated like that. A, they're a part of that society. So maybe what the French society should do is stop discriminating against the people, ghettoizing people and putting them in bon lose, uh, discriminating against people because they want to wear African dress and that sort of stuff. The more natural that they make it so that people can naturally be themselves and assimilate and, and uh, be a part of society, maybe there wouldn't be so much backlash. Maybe there wouldn't be so many people uh, you know, trying to go the other way, pushing back against their society. That's why France has a problem with Islamic extremism. That's why every few months in France, some young Libyan or young Moroccan blows themselves up in the subway or something like that because they continue to ghettoize people and push them to the furthest of extremes. France likes to pretend like it's a country where, you know, everybody is treated with egality and, and we're all for in this fraternity and stuff like that. But in actuality, if you have a name like Mohammed, if you do have a background that comes from Tunisia, if you are a black person from Mali or Senegal who lives in France, you will be treated differently. You will be ghettoized. So then, of course, you're going to be resentful against that society and you're going to cling to a culture that can give you more upliftment, that can give you more pride in yourself. And that's one of the biggest problems in France and, and, and in a lot of Western countries as well. Continuing here. Uh, so you don't understand, she added, but you sing. Uh, the Olympics, uh, okay. So yeah, she responded to her critics on French television in 2019, saying of her music, in the end, it speaks to everyone. You don't understand, she added, but you sing. Exactly. I sing, ooh, ja, ja. Uh, something, something, ja, ja. That's all I know. I mean, hey, it's music, right? Music breaks down all language barriers. <laughs> the Olympics uh, Fuhrer appears unlikely to subside soon. As a commenter on France, as a commentator on France Inter Radio put it, France has no oil, but we do have debates. In fact, we almost deserve a gold medal for that. All right. So shout out to Roger Cor Cohen and Aurelian Breeden for writing this article. Very interesting article. I hope Aya Nakamura performs at the Olympics. I hope she shuts it down. I hope she shows her big fat black ass to all those racist white supremacists supremacists in France who just want to hate on this black woman for doing her own thing, you know, uh, for rising to the top, for being a single mother, for being a woman who, you know, overcame so many obstacles, being an immigrant, being poor, being black in racist ass France. She rose to the top. So shout out to her. Shout out to her. She's hard. She's hard. Shout out to the sister. Anyway, continuing on. 
with some more French news. Going to be looking at this story here about some Black people who moved to Quebec. Quebec is the French-speaking part of Africa, and they are reviving the community there. As you know, Canada, like many other countries in the Western world, has a declining birth rate. Uh, Quebec is one of those regions as well that has that issue. Also, Quebec is very strong on its French identity. So I believe what they're doing is allowing more and more French speakers to move to the country. But the thing is, in France, where the original French speakers come from, they have declining birth rates too. There's less and less white French people to come. So what do you do? You open the door for Moroccans, for Tunisians, for the Algerians, for the Senegalese, for the Cote d'Ivoireans, all the people who were forced to speak French because the French didn't know that they couldn't leave people the F alone <laughs> because they were forced to speak this language. Now they have that option. I believe actually Moroccans now can travel to France visa-free for tourism, just like how Americans can travel to Canada as well or Morocco and stuff like that. Very interesting to see what's happening in Canada uh, with their French-speaking populace. Continuing here. So, how African immigrants have revived a remote corner of Quebec. A view across Lake Osixco in the northern Quebec mining town of Ruin Noranda. Hundreds of newcomers from Africa have filled a shortage of workers in Ruin Noranda, creating a new community in a remote mining town. This was published on March 30th, 2024, written by Nor Norimitsu Onishi and photographs by Nansuna Stuart Ulen. Not long ago, the handful of African immigrants in Ruin Noranda, a remote remote city in northern Quebec, all knew one another. There was the Nigerian woman long married to a Quebecois man, uh, the odd researchers, the odd researchers from Cameroon or the Ivory Coast, and of course, the Doyen, a Congolese chemist who first made a name for himself driving a Zamboni at uh, hockey games. I don't know what any of that means, uh, but <laughs> that's a crazy story. Uh, so yeah, the community used to be very small is what it sounds like. Uh, today, newcomers from Africa are everywhere. In the streets, supermarkets, factories, hotels, even at the church basement boxing club. A couple from Benin was taken over, uh, a couple from Benin has taken over Chez Moras, a city institution that introduced a greasy spoon favorite poutine to the region. And women from several corners of West and Central Africa are, were chatting at the city's new African grocery store, Epicerie into Cochurel. Since last year, it's like the gate of hell or the gate of heaven. Something opened and everybody just kept trooping in. I've never seen so many Africans in my life. Folake Lawanson Savar, 51, the Nigerian whose husband is Quebec. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. Quebeco, Quebeco. I can't speak French. Quebecos. I'm going to say it in hard American accent. Quebecos. <laughs> the Nigerian whose husband is Quebecos said to la uh, loud laughter in the store. Uh, continuing here. So yeah, uh, <laughs> very funny to see these boots, man. These are hilarious boots. Do people wear these boots in winter? If that man got leather pants. Oh, God. This outfit is atrocious. I don't know. No, that's a her. Okay. She gets a pass. She just wanted to hop out. <laughs> please stop. Acti said, please stop. I'm crying laughing. I don't know what you're talking about. Are you laughing at the outfit? Because this is a horrible fit. Jesus Christ. She got the Ugg boots, the leather pants. The <laughs> She got a tight. You got a tight hoodie on. You got a tight hoodie. Oh, maybe it's a, a, a loose turtleneck. And she got the uh the bonnet on. Oh God. Oh God. This is this is what makes white supremacists mad when they go to Walmart. They're like, we're losing our country. I went shopping for pasta and saw this. I would be mad too if I saw this at the supermarket. Stop it, girl. Stop it. Stop it. But it's uh different. <laughs> All right. Uh Avery Adams said, uh, boots fire, leather pants, not it. Absolutely not. Absolutely not it. <laughs> All right, continuing here. <laughs> All right. So Ruin Naranda's transformation followed a surge of immigrants Canada has allowed in as temporary workers in recent years to address widespread labor shortages. Many have been able uh, to eventually turn their temporary status into permanent residency, the final step before citizenship. Uh, Thomas Anderson jumped into the comments. I saw the movie Ghost in the Shell, and although the race swapped, the city and the story was incredibly diverse with no defined ethnicity. Very interesting. We might review Ghost in the Shell. Thanks for the shout out, uh, or thanks for the recommendation, Thomas Anderson, if it was that. Uh, so the influx of immigrants has also raised concerns contributing to the nation's housing crisis and straining public services in some areas, leading to the government of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to announce plans to rein in 
their numbers. The increase has created African communities in the unlikeliest places in the French-speaking province of Quebec. Some are working in logging in boreal forests. Others, after becoming permanent residents or citizens, are government workers in indigenous towns accessible only by boat or small propeller planes. That's interesting, man. That's interesting. So they're, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how exactly how to feel about this because I don't know if my audience is very xenophobic and they hate immigrants and they want them to go back and stuff like that. But it's very interesting, right? Like you guys, people love capitalism, right? We like cheap iPhones. We like MacBooks that cost $500. You like, you know, Jordan shoes and all that stuff. All that takes capitalism. All that takes human capital. All that takes people willing to work almost work for free damn near Let's spend their lives away in these factories and go to remote places and do the jobs people like all the cheap shit but you don't like what it comes with and let's keep it real all the mining towns that are dying in america and in canada need to be filled by people and americans generally because we like cheap shit and we're selfish as hell we don't want to have kids let's keep it absolutely a buck americans don't want to have kids People in the Western world don't want to have kids. Partially, that's due to women now having more economic opportunity, educational opportunity, so they can wait to have kids. So then what are we going to do about the people that we want to deliver our Uber Eats, the people that we want to, you know, uh, teach our kids foreign languages, the people that are going to work in these mining towns or these car factories or all the jobs that the people in these societies don't want to do and are not creating new people to replace them to do? You got to bring in the immigrants. You got to bring in the immigrants. I'm, I'm going to keep it real. I don't know where this sentiment came from, where now I have to feel scared to speak up for immigration. Because a lot of people now, even black people now, have become extremely xenophobic and racist and, and stuff like that against immigrants. Now, on one hand, I know where it comes from because a lot of the Africans sometimes hate on the indigenous black people who have been in these countries for centuries. Black people didn't just show up in Canada. Black people have been in Canada since Canada began. The same with America as well. And we all know that the Nigerians and some other Africans call us Akatas and they have disrespectful names for us. And they tell their kids not to play with black Americans or black Canadians because we are bad influences on them and all that sort of stuff. But yet and still, yet and still, yet and still, they are our brothers and not all of them are like that. Some of them are like that. I would even say a good portion of them are like that, but not a lot of them are like that. And we have to keep it real. A lot of black people from Africa look up to black people from the West or from the diaspora and that sort of stuff because of what we've been able to achieve and do and what we stand for. But let's keep it absolutely real. I don't know why I feel bad speaking up for immigrants right now, because this used to be something that I felt like everybody was on the same page, but now everybody's talking about kick the immigrants out. Kick the immigrants out. Send them niggas back where they came from. Go back to your country. But ain't, ain't that sort of the talking points that the white supremacists used to throw at us? Ain't, didn't they used to yell at us, go back to Africa, nigga? If you don't like America, go back to Cameroon, nigga? All that sort of stuff. Now we're throwing that back at the immigrants? Is that really how we feeling right now? Is that really how we feeling? Because all I'm seeing here, all I'm seeing here is that generally, by and large, in America and in Canada, the immigrants are coming, breathing new life into communities, doing work, trying to take care of their families. I know a lot of people are jumping in the comments right now because as soon as you start talking about immigrants, everybody gets all up in their feelings. But let's keep it real. You're most likely to be raped, murdered, killed, robbed by a, a, a person who was born in your country rather than somebody who came there and is trying to work at Postmates. Let's keep it absolutely a buck. But I don't know where this is coming from. I don't know where this is coming from, but I'm always going to be, uh, I'm always going to be for people being able to move, live, and be where they want to be, as long as they follow the laws, as long as they're not hurting people, as long as they are not coming to be terrorists, as long as they're trying to do the right thing. I don't get why people are hating on the immigrants, but now I'm going to jump into the comments. Let's see. So, uh, yeah, Thomas Anderson said he mentioned Ghost in the Shell, uh, the city, because it's the future. I think it's accurate, but I do recommend it. So we'll probably watch it. I do think, you know, cities in the future will become, you know, more diverse, but the the opposite can happen. Like there could be a backlash to more diversity. I think that's real. Avery Adams says, I want 10 kids shaking my head. Women don't want to push that many out. Okay. <laughs> I just put my uh, Trump head on, LOL. I'm okay with immigrants as long as they do it the right way. Okay. I think we can all agree on that. Like nobody says that like, you should just be able to sneak into Monaco or sneak into Italy and just, you know, get treated the same. Like you should try to do it the right way. But at the same time, you know, our countries 
should be responsible to the poorer people of the planet who we generally take resources from. Let's keep it absolutely real. We as Americans, or our government at least, ruined Latin America. The reason why the Guatemalans are coming, the Hondurans are coming, is because not that long ago, we killed their presidents. We killed their Martin Luther Kings. We killed their political leaders. We literally destroyed their nations. The word banana republic comes from the idea that our company, the, the Belmonte uh, Banana Company, wanted to buy more land. But the Guatemalans or the Hondurans or one of those countries down there said, uh, hey, no, as a company, you can't just buy our land. This is our country. So then the banana company called the American government and said, send the army. Send the army. Like, literally, this is what we do to other nations. We killed the president of Chile. We've killed the leaders of new African nations who wanted to bring independence and freedom to, to their nations. So then we can't do all of that to those people and then be mad when those people want to come and uh, you know try to make a better life. Because damn, if they got the guns, I might as well be with the winners. That's how most people think, right? Most people think that. Most people think, I got to be with the winners. I got to be with the winners. And that's what America is. That's what the West generally is so far. Whether the winning was right or wrong, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Avery, uh, Acti said, uh, I don't remember who it was, but one guy told me or us that he went to Alaska on a working visa to work there and he got paid $50 an hour or something, but he was in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> That's crazy, right? Like most Americans don't want to go to Alaska for $50 an hour, right? Most don't want to do that. We want to stay in San Diego. We want to stay in Miami. We want to ball out with the bitches on South Beach. That's what people want to do. They don't want to go to uh, Burlington, Alaska and have your homie be a grizzly bear and uh, have to dodge like the wolves at night. Nobody wants to do that for $50 an hour. Let's keep it absolutely a buck. I, I don't know. I don't know where, you know, Listen, if there are people that want to do those jobs, fine, let them have it, right? Like, you know, Louisiana is dying, Michigan is dying, you know, Maine is dying. Why not fill them up with people and breathe and breathe new life into that? Do we want to be stubbornly stubborn so stubborn stubborn and link? I cannot say ad libs now. Do we want to be so stubborn that we see our country die? Or do we not really care about cheap iPhones? I want to ask everybody this. Would you pay $7,000 for an iPhone if it meant there were no more immigrants in your country? Would you want to pay $7,000 for an iPhone? <laughs> Would you want to pay? <laughs> Is that what you want? Because I want my cheap-ass iPhones. I want my $200 Js. I don't want $3,000 Js. You get what I'm saying? All right. Um, Thomas Anderson said, immigration is a natural phenomenon, normal in many forms in life. Pro or anti-immigration is like being pro or anti-biology, weather, sea currents, etc. Yeah, it is natural for people to move. Like, you know, the, the movement of people is what life is about. Like, we are, we're all transitioning. We're all changing. We're all moving all around this planet, right? So, yeah, it is a bit natural. Should laws be respected? Yes, but should our country set up impossible barriers that make it hard for people to get in, especially if we come from Western developed nations where we have a lot of land, a lot of opportunity, a shrinking population, and a ton of jobs that people don't want to do? Should we be that ignorant? I don't know. Um, Avery Adams said, go back, no. <laughs> LMAO. Amen, Simon. Acti said, he was chopping ice or something. I don't know whatever people do in Alaska. <laughs> chopping ice. That's hilarious. Uh, Avery Adams says, I would, I know, I would, no lie. I just feel like I wouldn't want my partner to go with me too. Okay, Avery, all right, you you don't want your, your, your baby mama to come with you or your girl to come with you to Alaska. How else are you going to survive in Alaska? What you going to do, cuddle with a polar bear? You got to bring your, you, you got to bring your bunny with you. You got to, <laughs> you can't go. <laughs> I'm tripping. How are you going to go to the snow? I guess it's like they say, you can't bring sand to the beach, right? So you can't bring snow. You can't bring your snow bunny to the snow. <laughs> I'm tripping. I'm tripping right now. Uh, so Avery said, you know what? You have a point, Simon. I wouldn't want to pay 7K for no damn iPhone. I'm just saying, well, like this world is built on, you know, cheap labor and people that are willing to work for anything, right? So that's what I'm saying, man. I don't know. The tomatoes in America would be hella expensive if we didn't have Mexican slave labor, essentially. Let's keep it, let's keep it a buck. Uh, continuing here. Um, 
While African immigrants have long lived in the province's large cities, the newcomers are a recent phenomenon in rural areas. Uh, driven by a graying population and declining birth rates, the labor shortage has drawn many from Francophone Africa to Quebec, including the Rune Norand, a mining city of 42,000 people about 90 minutes north of Montreal by plane. Across Canada, the number of temporary uh, residents, a category that includes foreign workers, but also foreign students and asylum seekers has soared in recent years. It has doubled in the past two years alone to 2.7 million out of Canada's total population of 41 million. That's a large percentage of people. That's a large percentage of people uh, moving into Canada. Canada, that's like, wow, that's, that's incredible. And I know that's a radical change for Canadians to face, but you know, if you want to see your country grow, Canada's like the second biggest nation in the world. Like, let's keep it real. If Americans can find a way to live in Phoenix, Arizona, we met we the fastest growing city in America right now is in the middle of the desert. Let's keep that absolutely real. That's crazy. That's cra people should not live in Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson. There are we have about four states that should be inhospitable to humans. Uh <laughs> Arizona a large section of New Mexico, <laughs> most of Alaska, and uh, <laughs> and anywhere Diddy is. <laughs> anywhere Diddy is is not where people should be. <laughs> we have places in America no human should be. So I'm sure the Canadians can find a way to make the second largest nation on earth hospitable for people. They have all that land. Like they could pack that place out, honestly, and still have room to grow. Like Canada can find a way. Plus, the earth is heating up too. They can fill up Canada with a bunch of Africans. They'll they'll survive. They'll find a way. They are smart. They work hard, nigga. We work hard, nigga. Okay, work hard in northern Canada. I'm continuing. Uh, Canada's immigration policy has traditionally focused on attracting highly educated and skilled immigrants, but many temporary foreign workers are now being hired by companies for less skilled jobs in manufacturing and the service industry, fueling debates about whether they will contribute as much to Canada's economy as past immigrants did. Rune Noranda's uh, once tiny African population has uh, was made up of individuals who were hired for technical positions in the mining industry or as researchers at the local university. We have professors and engineers, said Valentine Brin, the director of La Mosaic, a private organization that helps new immigrants. And then there was a shift. Okay, so uh, <laughs> they're selling bad wigs. This is how you know the Africans moved in. It's bad wig time. Uh, it's bad wig season. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is how you know the Africans have moved in because <laughs> they got the, the African wig stores in, fu in full effect. In full effect. It's bad wig season. We're going to get us a white zaddy. They're going to get white zaddy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Thomas Anderson said J-Lo might also get involved in a case against Diddy, cold case from the 90s that they might reopen. And then Thomas Anderson said, I love Diddy. That's crazy. Oh, uh, that's crazy. <laughs> um, that's cra That would be insane if J-Lo started attacking Diddy too. That would be crazy. That would be crazy. I, I would I would not see that coming. And I would like to know what J-Lo thinks about everything related to Diddy. Like, did she see any of the freak-offs? Was J-Lo in the freak-off? Was J-Lo the freak-off uh, queen? Did she kick the whole thing off? I don't know. All right. Uh, the shift occurred partly because of the city government's decision in 2021 to increase efforts to help local companies recruit foreign workers, said Mariev Mignol, the director of the local development center, the city's economic development arm. Our companies uh, were suffering from such a shortage of workers that it was slowing down Rune Naran's economic development, Ms. Milno said. For G5, a family-owned company that owns and operates hotels and restaurants in the city, the pool of local workers had been shrinking for years, said Tatian Gabriz, who oversees the company's two hotels. Young people were more drawn to highly paid mining jobs. Immigrants, most from Colombia, are soon expected to make up about 10% of the company's 200-person workforce, Ms. Gabriz said, adding that they allowed the company to operate without constantly worrying about staff shortages. It's changed my life, Ms. Gabriz 
said. Precise numbers are difficult to find, but Africans are believed to make up the largest group of temporary foreign workers in the city. About 4,000 to 4,500 temporary foreign workers are now in the Rune Narand region following a sharp increase since 2021, according to the local development center. When Amy Pinji arrived in the region from the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2008, Africans were so few that they all were able to know one another. Interesting. So here's Pinji right here, a Congolese immigrant, and he ain't getting no lighter. He ain't got no vitamin D, but that man's still dark, dark. Anyway, uh, Thomas Anderson said, not her attacking Diddy. She's involved in the crime. He allegedly shot a woman in the face. Okay, so they're bringing up the club shooting face. They're bringing up the club shooting case again. Uh, I thought that case was, you know, Diddy was found, you know, innocent and Shine got sent to Belize and, you know, J-Lo walked away scot-free because of <laughs> white privilege. But uh, if they reopen that case, that'd be crazy. So if you spotted one, you would exchange phone numbers right away and then call each other to meet up for coffee, Mr. Pinji said. It was like a family back then. With a background in chemistry, Mr. Pinji came to work at a mining company, but he also took on odd jobs, including operating a Zamboni at Hawker Games in a town north of Rune Naran, which drew a lot of attention and helped him meet people. People were curious in a positive way, he said. They wanted to know what I was doing here, what brought me here. Mr. Pinji eventually married a local woman and even ran unsuccessfully for local office. Today, temporary workers from Africa often arrive as part of a family project, said Mohamed Meti, a La Mosaic member from the Ivory Coast, who is getting a doctorate in mining engineering in Rune Norand. Supported by their extended families, they typically come to Quebec on two-year contracts with a single employer. If their visas allow, they can apply for permanent residency at the end of the contracts and sponsor their families to join them in Canada. So this is the brother right here. Um, he looks like the guy in that meme, you know, the, the telephone meme, the angry, angry guy meme. I don't know. I'm joking right now. All right. Mohammed uh, Meti is a doctoral student in mining engineering from the Ivory Coast. Shout out to the brother right here. Thomas Anderson said, the people in my country have started to give me weird looks ever since there was an uptick in immigration. What country are you in, Thomas Anderson? Because that will happen a lot of times in uh, foreign countries. And Thomas Anderson, if you're black, you know, we have to remember that even in a country where they say, you know, the immigrants are the problem or we don't want the, I don't know, Ukrainians or the Turks here, they always mean black people too. In the Netherlands, interesting. Interesting in the Netherlands, because I've heard only positive things about the Netherlands. Uh, but Thomas, let us know what it's like living in the Netherlands, because my wife really likes it. She's heard that it's the quote unquote perfect country. Right. And that it's uh, very diverse and stuff like that. And that the uh, the the Dutch people. Right. They're the Dutch people. Right. Not the Danish. The Danish come from Denmark. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, she said that, you know, the Dutch are like very nice. Uh, that they have uh, great public transport, great social securities, safety nets, all that sort of stuff. Let us know. Uh, Thomas Anderson said it's good, but kind of weird lately. Let us know. Build on that. I think in the Netherlands, didn't you guys elect a far right guy who became the uh, leader? Like, I forgot his name. I don't know if that was Denmark, Denmark or the Netherlands. I always get those two countries confused. But one of those countries elected a guy with like uh, very white hair, slicked back, and he's like very right wing. Let us know which, what, what's up with that guy. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so, because many temporary workers are initially tied to, sing to a single employer, they can sometimes endure abuses, including unwarranted firings and low wages, said Mr. Bryn of La Mosaic. Even if working conditions are good, the isolation in remote places in Quebec and the separation from their families takes a heavy toll, some African immigrants said. As a Cameroonian, Monteg... Montangamo Ninji, 40, uh, left her husband and children in 2022 to work as a cook at a fast food chain in Rune Naranda. Uh, though her employer treated her and four other Cameroonian kitchen workers well, even providing lodging, Miss Ninji said being a be, being by herself led to serious depression. Leaving my family and kids behind is the most difficult thing I've ever passed through, she said. Temporary workers, she said, have to be psychologically strong to cope with loneliness while working, while looking forward to when they can gain residency and invite their families. Still, things had gotten better, Miss NG said, with Rune Noranda's African population rising rapidly. An association for Cameroonians now had 52 members up from 10 last year, she said. 
They meet once a month over Cameroonian dishes like fufu with indole uh, spinach stew. Jump into the comments right here. So uh, Thomas Anderson said, uh, there's a, a Turkish shop in every street in Rotterdam. <laughs> You know, we're starting to call like Western Europe just Western Turkey because the Turks have taken over Germany. They're taking over the Netherlands. They stomping, man. They want it back. They want it back. Y'all had it for a while, but they want it back. <laughs> oh, I love seeing white people fight. I love seeing white people fight. It's, it's one of the things that brings me joy to my heart a little bit. When I see the infighting among the whites, like how the whites are fighting over whether to support Israel or not, or whenever the Balkan whites start going at it, it brings me a little bit of joy. Because at least I know that they will never be on code enough to like inflict the harm that they could do to the world. As long as the Russians and Ukrainians are fighting, this little black boy here will be happy. I'm continuing here. Uh, so there's a Turkish shop in every street in Rotterdam. Uh, yeah, he's super Islamophobic, but he does uh, consider Jews part of the Aryan race. That don't make no sense. See, the whites never make any sense. Yes, there are white Jews, but it's insane how they like flip flop back and forth when it's convenient for them. Like, yeah, the Jews are Aryans too. Nigga, what? <laughs> anyway, uh, Thomas Anderson said, uh, there's inflation and hard to get a house. So people are angry, I guess. Yeah, I did hear that there was a housing shortage in the Netherlands as well. Uh, because not a lot of new houses have gone up and stuff like that. And that rent there is very expensive, like it is in many other parts of the world. So very interesting to see what's happening in the Netherlands. Uh, but overall, Thomas, I want to ask you, would you want to stay there? Or do you plan on moving, like going somewhere else? And do you think the Netherlands in general is a good place for Black people? Or do you think it's too problematic of a society? I would like to know what you think about that, about those two questions. Let us know. So continuing here, the African community's growing presence was perhaps felt most prominently when the city's most famous poutine restaurant, Chez Moras, passed two years ago into the hands of Carlos Soji and Sylvian Senu, a young couple from Benin. All right, so they entrepreneurs right here. They be out here cooking it up. So Carlos Soji and Sylvia Senu, the owners of Chez Moras, ruined Narenda's most famous poutine restaurant. Okay, interesting. Poutine, the caloric combination of French fries layered with cheese curds and gravy, has become Quebec's signature dish worldwide. But it was introduced to the Rue Naranda region in the 1970s after the Morasse family discovered it in another part of Quebec, uh, said Christian Moras, the restaurant's former owner. Generations grew up wolfing down poutine at Chez Moras, cementing its place in the city's history and culture. When Mr. Moras decided to retire in 2022, he considered several purchase offers, setting aside offers from Quebecos in favors of the couple from West Africa. Mr. Moras said that Mr. Soji had worked for him as a delivery man and had the soul of an entrepreneur. Beautiful to see, you know, these black folks bought this famous poutine restaurant. And now they turned it up. I wonder if they made it more spicy, though. I got to keep it real because that looks hot. <laughs> Did they put chilies on that? Are those? What is that? Is that jalapenos? <laughs> the white folks are like, it's too hot. It's too spicy. <laughs> I can't do it. But poutine is hard. I love poutine. I had poutine one time in Tunis. Very good. Used to eat it a few times. Uh, two orders of poutine, a classic Quebecois comfort food, awaiting delivery at Chez Moras. Uh, as a lifelong resident, Mr. Moras said he also witnessed how African newcomers had revived his city. Because of the labor shortages, our supermarkets were almost closed on weekends and our restaurants were closed two, three days a week and in the evenings, he said. Now they're open and it's all African workers. Chez Moras's staff includes six cooks recently arrived from Benin and Togo. To the surprise of Mr. Soji and Miss Senu, their purchase of Chez Moras drew intense media attention. A new era begins at Chez Moras, said Radio Canada, the public broadcaster. The Globe and Mail described how immigrants from Benin saved a Quebec town storied poutineri. And the newspaper Le Devoir simply said, the best poutine in the world is now Beninois. <laughs> okay. The French take everything too seriously. It, bro, it is literally French fries with cheese and gravy. Y'all got to chill. As Americans, we don't take burgers this seriously. We don't take uh, enchiladas this seriously. We don't take nachos this seriously. I know y'all are going to say y'all can't take it seriously because we stole it. Damn right we did. 
damn right we did and we made it better. But seriously, uh, they, the the French uh, Quebecois have made poutine now, Benoit, like, chill, bro. Y'all got to chill. The French get on my nerves. The French get on my nerves. <laughs> I'm continuing here. <clears throat> so, uh, so Thomas Anderson said he won't move. Okay, so maybe the Netherlands isn't that bad, or maybe it's just because you have your job there and your life there. Let us know what you think. So Thomas Anderson said, I would move to America if I could personally work for Diddy. <laughs> Boy, you a wild boy. You say you want to work for Diddy. Diddy going to have you coming over to the hotel at 2 a.m. Talking about take that, take that. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's insane. Uh, Thomas Anderson said, uh, yeah, I would move to America if I could personally work for Diddy. <laughs> y'all are insane tonight. Y'all are absolutely insane. I love my live streams, man. I love when y'all come in here and say the wildest stuff. Anyway, this is the final article for today. We were going to cover all these different stories about the French-speaking Black world. This is the last one for today, and then I'm going to go to sleep because I got work in the morning. So, Haitians in Chile, rough going for many, prompts large-scale migration towards U.S. This is, uh, you know, kind of personal to me, though I have not been to Chile. I make money in Chile. My students... <laughs> come from Chile. I have had great relations with like Chilean people and a lot of them are like very white, but they're very respectable, very kind, very calm people. I like the Chilean people. They're excellent, very dope people. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have not spoken to any Haitian Chile Chileans yet or any Afro Chileans yet. And I know that's because, you know, English classes are expensive. And the, you know, thousands of black people that are in Chile and Peru and Latin America in general are at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder and don't have the money, the capability, the opportunity to study English. So I'm not interacting with them. But I would love to one day, and I hope that does happen. Uh, Donnie Williams jumped into the chat. He said, uh, speaker, and then he did a pound. So pound to you, Donnie Williams. We're finishing up this live stream very soon. We're going to just read this brief article about Haitians in Chile, and then I'll give my two cents. So with Denska, Andre, 21, uh, answers questions at a migrant aid agency in the working class neighborhood of Independencia in Santiago, Chile. This was written by Patrick J. McDonald, published on October 1st, 2021. Santiago, Chile. Seven years ago, Wedenska, Andre's father, sent her a plane ticket to relocate to his adopted homeland, Chile, where he was among a fast-growing population of Haitian immigrants. Andre, 21, today has permanent residency in the South American nation and a steady job helping migrants in Santiago, the capital. Still, she contemplated joining an ongoing exodus of fellow Haitians from Chile to the United States. Who doesn't want to live the American dream, Andre, who, uh, who has six siblings living in Chile, said recently. Because she is doing well, Andre ultimately decided to remain in Chile when three of her cousins, also in their 20s, embarked on the more than 4,000-mile journey north. Chile, a country of 19 million people, was previously home to many, if not most, of the thousands of Haitian migrants whose presence at a now cleared encampment in Del Rio, Texas, dramatized the immigration challenges facing the Biden administration. That's interesting. So a few years ago, when we saw those white guys on horseback whipping black men at the Texas border, a lot of those black men were Haitians coming from Chile, trying to cross the border illegally. I did not know that. See, I learned something new today. You learn something new every day. That's crazy. That's crazy to, to run from Chile all the way to America and then get whipped on by a cowboy on horseback. Has to be one of the funniest things that could ever happen to anybody. Seriously, that is insane. Uh, continuing here, Chile has long boasted one of the region's most robust economies and, has, and also hosts one of the world's largest Haitian diasporas. Haitians began to immigrate in large numbers to South America, mostly to Chile and Brazil, in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake that devastated their Caribbean country, killing tens of thousands and further battering the economy in a nation that has long been the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. In 2012, fewer than 2,000 Haitians resided in Chile, according to official statistics. Since then, the Haitian presence has increased almost a hundredfold. At the end of 2020, according to an official government estimate, more than 182,000 Haitians lived in Chile. My God, I did not know that. I did not know that at all. All right. Um, 
continuing here, plentiful work in a previously relaxed visa system drew them to the country. Uh, Haitians mostly settled at, in the environs of Santiago, generally residing in working class districts, often in cramped housing. They typically staffed low paying jobs in restaurants, hotels, construction, maintenance, and factories, while also working as street vendors. Even if earning Chile's minimum wage, about $430 a month. Haitians in Chile, in Chile generally did better than compatriots in Haiti, where the average monthly wage is about $100. Jump into the comments here. Uh, Thomas Anderson says, if I ever get access to super advanced weapons technologically, I will give them to the Haitians. Facts. You know, what we should have done as black folks is rally around Haiti. We should have done that. This is one of the tragedies for us as a people, right? And I know that circumstances at times prevented us from doing that. Like, you know, many of the African nations were colonized. Uh, black folks in America were still catching hell. Black folks in other parts of Latin America were catching hell. But if we could turn back the hands of time, one of the things we should have done is all rally around and protect Haiti at all costs, right? Like we should give Haiti vibranium, we should give Haiti the infinity stones. There is no country on earth that deserves more than Haiti, period. Uh, continuing here. While many Haitians in Chile struggle, others have prospered, opening businesses and becoming part of the fabric of Chilean society. Even as they say, they often face discrimination in a nation where most residents have European or indigenous roots. The Haitian influx represented contemporary Chile's first major black demographic presence. That's a lie. That's a lie. Uh, Chile was full of slaves back in the day, and then they literally expelled them when slavery ended, which is one of the tragedies that happened uh, in this nation. Uh, one of the myths that persist in the Chilean mind, because my Chilean students have told me, is that, you know, there was slavery in Chile, but all the slaves left when slavery ended because Chile is so cold, when that's not true at all. When you look at the history, what actually happened, they ended slavery and said no black man can have citizenship in Chile, period. So then they all went to Peru. They all went to Argentina. Then in Argentina, they got killed in the war. And then some of them went to Brazil. And now they're, you know, balling out. Anyway, continuing here. Uh, unlike the United States, Brazil, and many Caribbean nations, Chile never had a large-scale slave uh, population. That is a lie. That is an absolute lie. And I can't believe this is in the LA. This is why I read the New York Times, because the LA Times, they're smoking weed while they write this. You've got to be on reefer writing this. How do you not do basic research? Unlike Chile never had a large scale African slave population, that is patently false. That is patently false. Who wrote this? Some Chilean. Some Chilean that needs to absolve themselves of white guilt always says some shit like that. Some only only people in Latin America who say that sort of stuff are like the whites who want to absolve their countries to make themselves seem better than America. You can't literally say this with a straight face. You've got to be kidding me here. Anyway. A 2019 government survey found that almost half of Haitian respondents in Chile said they had experienced discrimination because of their race or inability to speak Spanish. Several high-profile incidents, including the fatal police shooting in August of a Haitian man in the central Chilean city of La Ligua, uh, have sparked allegations of racism. So here's Aline Fanor, 29, is a nursing technician at a pharmacy in the Santiago's working class neighborhood of Independencia. All right, shout out to the sister right here getting her pharmacy on. Okay, she still got a very bad wig. But uh, hey, uh, you know, <laughs> we have to send some of our, uh, our African sisters <laughs> there to do their hair, to do the braids at least, to do the braids, do the straightening, you know. Get it right for them because these bad wigs got to go in 2024 and beyond. No more bad wigs. No more bad wigs. We don't want that. No mo. No mo. Anyway, I've uh, I I'd have already fled to the United States if it weren't for my husband who likes Chile, said Alina Fanor, 29, a Haitian nursing technician who said that a dissatisfied client had recently used a racial epithet and threatened to ruin my life. Okay, so an angry customer called her the N-word and then says she'll ruin her. Uh, what, what she should have done is taken off that bad wig and put them hands on that boy. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. But I hate the past perfect tense. Who says this? I'd have already fled why didn't you say I would have fled or I will flee if something like that? I hate the past perfect tense. It's so annoying. We should just use the simple past tense for the past perfect. It makes more sense. It just would be easier. But language has changed. <laughs> language has changed. That's too much change. I'm bringing too much radical change now. Continuing. 
She said she tried to file a complaint with police, uh, but officers refused to take her statement. Haitians in Chile have endeavored to maintain their cultural legacy. Andre was crowned Miss Haiti in Chile in 2019 in a community beauty pageant. There is a hidden racism in Chile, and I wanted to show a positive image of Haitian women, said Andre, who works for a municipal government migrant aid agency and is fluent in Spanish. In Chile, people think that Haitian women are ugly. When they see and hear me, they say, you don't look Haitian or you don't sound Haitian, which is wrong because I am Haitian and I am proud of it. Let's let's keep it absolutely real. You know, the brainwashing that has been done on people to think that black women are unattractive, that they're ugly and that sort of stuff is one of the worst crimes against humanity because black women are beautiful. And uh, even in white people's own history, they knew that black people were beautiful because if black women weren't beautiful, how come they could not control themselves from raping our grandmothers until now we have Beyonce? Like, seriously, why do we continue to push out this stereotype that black women are ugly, black women are unattractive? It's absolutely not true. And it, and, and it happens in Latin America way too much, which is why they have all that bleaching cream and bleaching uh, material down there. And why on TV, all they show are the whitest people that come from these very brown skin uh, nations. Uh, it's very disheartening to see this continue to plague the minds of people. Let's stop this. Let's stop this black women hate. Seriously, let's kill that. Kill that in 2024. No more bad wigs. No more black women hate. I don't know if those two things go hand in hand. And I know some toxic, woke <laughs> black girl is going to say, how dare you hate on my bad wig? <laughs> You're hating on black women. I know they're going to say that. But I want. I just want the best for our people. That's all. I just want the best. Continuing. But discrimination alone doesn't explain why thousands of Haitians abandoned Chile in recent months to embark on an extremely hazardous journey through South and Central America and Mexico. Uh, economics appears to be the engine driving the migration. Haitians interviewed in recent weeks in Chile, Mexico, and Colombia say Chile's prosperity often seemed out of reach to them for a variety of reasons. The challenges included language barriers. Haitian Creole and French are Haiti's official languages, increasingly tight visa restrictions, and the pandemic-driven economic downturn that has cost Chile millions of jobs, many in the service and construction sectors that are key employment hubs for Haitians. It was very hard to find work in Chile, said Jean Edelince, 36, who along with his wife and the couple's two-year-old daughter was among thousands of U.S.-bound Haitians in southern Mexico. And Chile is very expensive, much more expensive than Mexico, said Edelince, who resided for four years in Chile, working most recently in a plastics factory before embarking north this year. Haitians have been trickling out of South America bound for the United States for a number of years, but the lifting of pandemic era travel restrictions at a moment when South American economies were struggling to recover helped prompt record numbers to head north this year. A major catalyst appears to have been a widespread perception that a new White House occupant had opened the door to Haitians. Many Haitians have relatively in the United States, which is home to the world's largest Haitian diaspora, more than 700,000 strong, <laughs> most of them in uh, Northwest Miami. <laughs> Um, commentary spread by word of mouth and on internet chat groups suggested that the Biden administration was allowing Haitian asylum seekers to gain a foothold in the United States, especially if they arrived at the southwest border with small children. I heard that with Biden, it was easier for pregnant women and families with children to enter the United States, Andre said. Unlike Andre, about half the Haitians residing in Chile lack permanent residence. They face highly restricted job prospects. Many are forced to seek work in informal sectors where employers often pay below the legal minimum wage. The right center government of President Sebastian Pineda, responding to an anti-immigrant backlash among many Chileans, has tightened rules to make it harder for Haitians and other immigrants to attain permanent residence. We cannot allow hundreds of thousands of people who do not respect our migration law to continue to continue entering Chile, Pineda said in April 2018. They pretend to be tourists even though they're not. Uh, fun fact, Pineda recently died. He died in a helicopter crash in a lake in Chile. And many Chileans were actually somewhat happy about that. Well, not happy that he died, but he was a bad president. Some people said he was corrupt, uh, bad leader. So yeah, Pineda recently died, uh, kind of a goofball. Um, 
what he's saying here isn't inherently racist because as a leader of a nation, you are going to have people that want you to be more nationalistic and protect the borders, quote unquote, and stuff like that. So I'm not going to roast him for that. But yeah, very interesting what he is saying here. Uh, it seemed like the Haitians were just coming there looking for work, but even the Chileans themselves have a hard time finding work. Continuing, Haitians who were once allowed to enter Chile with only a passport and were readily able to find work in the previously booming economy now must acquire visas before arriving in Chile. They also need hard-to-get police clearances from Haiti, attesting that they have no potentially disqualifying criminal record before becoming eligible for residence. There has been a failure of public policies to include Haitians, which has to do with the language barrier, with social and employment discrimination, and also with racism, said Waleska Oreta, director of the Jesuit Migrant Service, a nonprofit Roman Catholic aid group. In 2018 and 2019, Chile instituted a program of voluntary return for Haitians, a total of 1,384 flew back to Haiti on nine flights that the government lauded as a humanitarian gesture, though critics denounced what they called a thinly disguised coerced repatriation. Chilean officials say they have not forcibly removed Haitians back to their troubled homeland where the president was assassinated in July and an earthquake struck in August. The United States recently expelled hundreds of Haitian migrants. Unrealistic expectations among many migrants help explain the mass out migration of Haitians from Chile, according to Chile's government. I think the difficulties the Haitians have faced are related with other factors, but not race. Alvaro Belo Lilo, Chile's top immigration official, told the Times, there was a high number who believed that it was easy to make large sums of money working in informal jobs, and reality shows that this is not the case in our country. So race will be a factor. Of course, it's not the only factor, but yes, the if the Haitians are saying that they face discrimination, you should believe them. Uh, and it's very annoying and very counterproductive for when non-Black people hear Black people talk about racism, they say there is no racism. We're not getting anywhere. We're not getting anywhere. Uh, continuing here, Evans Clarsema has not made a fortune in Chile, but he appreciates his adopted homeland. So here's dancer Evan Clarsema, teaches students at an academy in Santiago. I have to say, these pants should be against the law. You should not wear one long leg and one short short on both legs. What the hell are you doing? Who sold him this? I don't know if this is Photoshop. It looks a bit weird, but I would never wear something this horrible. And I'm ashy, but that man's feet are ashy as hell. There is no lotion in Chile. There is no lotion in Chile at all. That feet is dusty. He looks like he stomped the yard. That is insane. All right. And uh, yeah, I've heard from people that the Chilean women are not really lookers and uh, no comment. <laughs> There's nothing really to be said here. <laughs> I think the picture says enough <laughs> uh, here. Uh, but these pants are a violation, my boy. Don't do that. Don't do that. All right. I had some difficulties integrating into society, but that would have happened to me anywhere in the world, said Clarsema Forty, a Haitian dancer who arrived in Chile in 2009 to study sociology. Many in Chile recall Clarsema as the Haitian who, along with the Chilean dancers, performed La Cueca, Chile's national dance, before then President Michelle Bachelet in 2017. La Cueca is like a, you know, cowboy type of dance, like you're supposed to stomp your feet and, you know, pull on a little cowboy hat and it's kind of kind of cool, I guess. Uh, he later made television appearances and now gives dance lessons at a rented studio. He has since acquired Chilean citizenship, one of only 170 Haitians who have taken that step since 2010, the government says. I am fortunate because living from from dance is difficult, even as a Chilean. Clarsema said late last month as he greeted students in the middle-class Santiago neighborhood of Nunyao, uh, there is racism here, but it is often associated with poverty. Still, things have turned out well for me, and I don't feel like living anywhere else. And immigrating to the United States illegally is not an option for me. So shout out to this brother right here, but no shout out to his pants. Uh, so yeah, uh, for the Haitians in Chile, I wish y'all the best. Please don't immigrate to the U.S. illegally. It's very dangerous. You might get robbed. You might get killed. You might get whipped on horseback by a white cowboy who wants to relive slavery fantasies or something free of discrimination. That should be point blank, period. So 
for my duty as an African American, I'll always advocate for our people wherever they are in the world. And I'm advocating now for the Haitians in Chile. The same thing applies to the Africans who moved to Quebec and now they sell poutine. The same thing applies also to Aya Nakamura singing about Zsa Zsa in front of the world at the French Olympics. And uh, yeah, the same thing goes to the Senegalese president with his two wives who wants to represent for the young people of his country. My name is Simon Hill. I hope you enjoyed this live stream. This was a long one, but it was long overdue. It's been a very busy day, but I'm glad that everybody enjoyed it. Shout out to Thomas Anderson. Shout out to Donnie Williams. Shout out to Avery Adams. Shout out to my wife, Acti. Shout out to Rodman who jumped in and peace to everybody.